So I was wondering how it is to work with the XYZ boys and perhaps even SpectraVision who are somewhat new to the game but also have their own vernacular, their own uh, taste buds. Um, yeah. what, what is that association like? Uh, uh, that, it's good. I mean, the reason I, I just, I, think I came to Spectre Vision or XYZ via Spectre Vision mm -hmm. um, solely because I was looking for, I, you know, you, you hear so many horror stories about people going in and doing their second or first film producers that don't get them or pieces of shit and, uh, and the, I mean, the, the situation is, I mean, I'm a really yeah, hellish nightmare and, you know, I, I don't like hellish nightmares, so I, <laughs> I wanted to try to avoid it uh, as much as possible. And of all the companies I talked to, Spectre Vision convinced me that they were going to protect, that they understood my vision, uh -huh. that they were going to protect it and nurture it. And they were true to their work, they did that. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of producers say that, but they I felt that they were sincere in the moment they were. Do you, did, did you feel more vulnerable with a sophomore feature? I mean, your, your first attempt, just like, it's it's one of those rare cultish yeah. miracle stories that wasn't meant to happen, wasn't supposed to go where, where, no. where it went. No, I think I defied the gods. Yeah. <laughs> to, to make it, a, to make it, they wanted me to die in the, in the basement, but, uh, but I acted like all the demons you're working with. Um, one thing I admire in your two offerings is uh, the creation of legends, the creation of other worlds, the creation of underground worlds that are overtly a part of our society. Um, beyond lookbook, beyond like just sampling a whole bunch of drawings and texts and stuff like that, how does how does that look like in your writing process specifically? Before I even well, my writing process is I'll I'll just have a note a notebook for that particular story or idea mm -hmm. and whenever I have an idea of any kind if it fits into any, any of those projects it will go in that notebook and then also collect reference images or striking images that, that, that strike me <clears throat> they'll also get filed into the appropriate sort of project um, and then once if I start right, getting into something more into take a certain curve and get into it in a more detailed way or I'm starting to flesh it out into a screenplay. Um, then at the same time the imagery and the characters will start to get fleshed out more as well. And uh, if there's any things that are influencing it, I, I try to let them marinate and mutate, you know, into something into something that's uh, that's not that's uh, almost unrecognizable, if not completely unrecognizable. So that's one level of, of, of the process. Um, I think that the stuff with like my own uh, personal experiences and emotions filtering in, in, into it comes in this more in this screenwriting phase where uh, we're sort of setting up these, these these characters and their their particular fears and, and uh, desires. Yeah, you're trying to address certain certain obsessions or themes yeah. that that you're particular in, uh, particularly curious in at that very moment. Yes. And so it sort of like assimilates to whichever package you have, and the characters that are speaking to you the most at night, at God knows what hours. Exactly. Um, I could have said it better myself. <laughs> when you watch a film like Manny, and even your first, um, you get a sense that uh, you're flexing a lot of muscles mm -hmm. as you're filming. You're very well. Everything is the end game. It's worked towards the end game, which is post production. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what starts is these as these seeds with the notes and, and, and reference images. Is ever you know is ever present throughout the entire process. Uh, and as we go further, the, I, the, the sort of concept of what these images will look like, what these characters will look like, goes more and more crystal, and everything's just working towards achieving that in a very pragmatic way. You know? mm -hmm. I've talked to some people. I kind of got the impression they think that we were just like running around in the woods out of our minds or something like that, just like randomly filming the shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Nicholas Cage's character sort of like it becomes an emancipation of who he is as a, when he goes beyond the when he goes past the in, into the berserk phase. I was wondering if you could detail that specific uh, weapon choice. How did you? You mean the beast? Yeah. <coughs> how does that? How does? Well, again, during the during the 
process it sort of started as a as a as a as a, as a blade and weapon mm-hmm. and uh, as I worked on it and I worked on it with some designer people, uh, friends I realized that this didn't couldn't just be a weapon it had to be a talisman it had to be a manifestation of his psychosis that looked completely fucking insane in the, in the world you know so the most unlikely kind of chrome uh, sculpture from his brain, you know. Um, and what, and once, uh, once, once you land on something like that, then I'm going back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to note that my friend who did some sketches of it based the shape on the F from the Celtic Frost logo. The what logo? The F from the Celtic Frost logo. Okay. Contact in '83 and obsession with Ronald Reagan. What's the deal? Uh, Was it a bad year for you? We're, we're both. We're both. We were both born in 74. No way, that was 83 crazy. was a horrible year for me. Was it? Yeah. I, I, uh, 1988 was a bad year for me. 83 was, was fine. Uh, we were settling into Canada and I was watching PMAC cartoons and playing on television, you know? <laughs> Reagan, I feel, is just like a weird, totemic, you know, uh, figure of that era, like a weird TV head. Just, uh, signifies everything about that era in a beautiful visual way.